an interesting phenomenon that we've become kind of cult culturated towards having that accessibility of water bottles that a lot of people just carry around all the time. That's something relatively new. If you go back 30 or 40 years ago, people didn't carry a bottle of water around with them all the time as they do now, as many people do now. Um, if you want to have that freedom and at that accessibility, one of the things that's suggested is that you can use a reusable bottle and just fill it from the tap. So um, there were some quality issues that were brought up in the documentary. You heard one point of view. It's not necessarily the definitive point of view. And so that's why we're here to discuss and debate some of these issues. So I'd like to turn it over to any of you that have questions. Just uh, raise your hand and uh, feel free to, uh, to ask, to inquire. Okay, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so the Pacific Gyre, the Western Garbage Patch and the Eastern Garbage Patch, and also the Indian Gyre and the other gyre that he referred to, there are actually four large ones, um, contain tons and tons of plastic because of natural ocean currents and the breakdown of plastics. So the natural cur ocean currents bring those plastics to certain predictable places on the Earth so if you want to know how bad are the oceans, you can go there and look. And we've known that for many, many decades now. And so that, that's why this gentleman goes to specific places. Now, over time, we've noticed more and more garbage accumulating there to the point that they're now called the Pacific Garbage Patches. So that kind of gives you an idea. They used to be called the gyres. Now they're called the Garbage Patches. And that's because of the breakdown of plastics and, and coming over there. Now, now, the other issue is, what he mentioned about the lanternfish, they eat these small pieces of plastic. What he did not mention is that bigger fish then eat the lanternfish, and guess who eats the bigger fish? That would be you and me. So we're feeding ourselves our own garbage. That is the truth of the matter. Yes. So the question was that according to the film, the FDA is aware of what's happening. So what are what? So the water bottles have been used in tap for water, but they're being reused, or are they um, being more responsible for where the tap water is being bottled? So are there any consequences for the bottled water companies themselves? Are they being taxed? Are they having heavy requirements levied on them? Sorry, I can talk about that one a little bit too. Um, the, the Food and Drug Administration's awareness and their authority are two very different things, okay? So being aware of something, like I'm aware BPA is a harmful chemical, but my awareness and my authority are two different things. I have no authority to change that. And that's true for the FDA too. They really don't have the authority. The reason they assign half a person to this is they have very little authority over this. They do not have the authority to require testing. They do not have the authority to, uh, for example, put a bottle bill in place. Only 11 states have bottle bills, and bottle bills are the most important thing, right? We're recycling less than 20%, but in Michigan, they're recycling more than 90%. What is the difference? The bottle bill in Michigan. That's the difference. That 20 cents, or Sorry, it's only 10 cents in Michigan, but that 10 cents means something to people. And they'll recycle if you put that little tiny incentive, and they won't if you don't. I'd like to mention also something they mentioned in the film. When you buy a bottle of water, you're buying a, a food. It's regulated by FDA, and you saw how much power the FDA has. When you, buy, when you drink water out of your tap, especially in a, in a city, 
you're drinking water that's heavily, heavily regulated by the EPA or by your state if the state wants to be more strict. And California is one of the strictest states in the country for how uh, pure and, and, and tested and so forth tap water has to be. So if you want safe, if you want to drink something safe, the safest thing to drink in the world is American tap water, municipal, especially large cities, because there's more testing. We do much more testing in large cities than smaller uh, water companies, water, water districts, and so forth. Our uh, small cities, uh, small towns don't have to test as much as big cities. So the safest beverage in the world is American municipal tap water. Yeah, not to say that not to say that anything is safe. There's nothing safe in the world. Okay, don't get me wrong. I said safest. Uh, we are required to disinfect our tap water in the United States, and there's two main chemicals that are used: uh, chlorine and a combination of ammonia and chlorine. And uh, Los Angeles is in the process of actually switching to the latter of those two. We're switching from chlorine, just chlorine, to chlorine and ammonia. And uh, there are byproducts that form in water when you disinfect it, but it's required and it's, and it's not as bad for you as undisinfected water. If you had undisinfected water, you'd be getting sick all the time. A lot of people would be dying of waterborne diseases. So that's why we're required to do that. Just to touch on it a little bit, um, how many people turn on their faucet at home and notice a discoloration in their water? Okay, I see a few hands. There's probably more than that, I would imagine. Um, that isn't indicative of the water that the water utilities are supplying you. That is directly related to the plumbing inside your home. Typically, if it's a yellowish, brownish color, it's only iron. Um, the best way to avoid that is to let the tap run until the water becomes cold and stays at a constant temperature. Typically, what happens when you first turn on water from your house, it'll be slightly cold and then it'll slightly warm up. That slightly warmer water is all the piping inside your home that's insulating, that is being insulated by your home, making your water a little bit warmer. Once you start getting cooler water and it stays at a constant cool temperature, that is water coming directly off the plumbing out in the street from the water utilities. And so you can avoid those unpleasant colors and tastes and odors and things by simply letting your tap run um, just a short time. Okay, hey, uh, more questions? Yes, we have one in the back, ma'am. Thanks. Um, I would say that mostly that's out of the expertise of this panel, to be entirely honest with you. But I don't mind taking a shot at it anyway. Um, the reality is this is a historical, cultural thing, and it does differ from country to country to some degree. But in, in the U.S., and I can speak mostly to that, we have allowed business free reign to a large degree. And, and some people think that that's the reason for our robust economy. Other people recognize that even in the face of you know, pretty severe regulations, you can still have a robust economy. But because we have this difference of opinion, the burden of proof is on the government. So if I make a chemical that a scientist says is unsafe, it is the government that has to prove the chemical's unsafe. The burden of proof is not on me. And that's a fundamental disconnect, I think. Um, the European Union is starting to swap that around and put the burden of proof on the manufacturers through their REACH program. Um, ultimately, we'll probably have to adopt something like that, too. But there's going to be a lot of kicking and screaming before that happens. Uh, one thing that the film mentioned is the cost comparison between bottled water and tap water. Anybody remember what it was? They said, two different numbers. They said there were two. One was 1,900 times and one was 2,000 times, essentially the same number. If you pay a dollar for a pint of bottled water, at the, at the, somewhere out here, 50, 100 feet from here, you're paying 2,000 times as much for that water as if you got it from the tap. Uh, we, we, a pint for a dollar means a gallon is eight dollars, and we sell 750 gallons of water for about two, two dollars and 50 cents in the city of LA. So that's how much more it costs. And that's not to mention that the uh, testing is different, it's more regulated, tap water is. And you're not paying for a package, and you don't have the, the, re, the after effects of having that package in your hand. 
and later on in the environment and the ocean or wherever else it might end up. So there's a big, big difference in the cost and the effects of tap water versus bottled water. The only reason, and somebody said at the beginning of this film, that the, the largest uh, scam perpetrated in the American public in the last 20 years is bottled water. The largest. And um, there's so many ways you can improve the environment by just drinking tap water out of a, out of a bottle that you, that you can wash yourself, such as uh, Mike has here. Yeah, we had a question hand. Do you have some? Okay, so the question is about the chemicals that are in tap water, fluoride or other things, and also what happens to the groundwater supply because it gets contaminated possibly by other chemicals that we use. We could probably sit and talk about this topic for several hours. Um, I'll, I'll touch upon it briefly. Um, regarding fluoride, uh, historically uh, on the East Coast, they fluoridated their water typically because it doesn't occur naturally um, as it does in warmer climates like it does in California. Um, there are some differences of opinion whether or not fluoride should be add, added to water. Uh, personally, I don't think it should. To me, that's more of a medication of a supply versus chlorine where it's a disinfection of the supply. However, with that, um, the amounts that are added are within safe levels. Uh, and in fact, we're not getting majority of our fluoride that we need to strengthen our teeth um, from drinking water. You do get it from other sources as well. So those, those are some of the reasons why um, utilities have chosen to add uh, fluoride to their drinking water. In terms of pharmaceuticals in the water supply, in terms of um, anything that's found in the water supply, there's something called the UCMR, the Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule that was passed in 1996 that requires the EPA to look at um, upwards of 25 or more chemicals every three years and require water utilities to sample for those. Something like that is not done with bottled water. So for example, the bottled water companies that um, take tap water and simply maybe send it through a, a granular activated carbon filter or something like that um, have no idea what's in there. Whereas water utilities are taking, um, collecting samples for these pharmaceuticals that are in water. Uh, last round for the UCMR2, we were sampling explosives in drinking water, perchlorate, TNT, things like that. Um, so we do have a lot of knowledge and treatment technologies are being developed um, for these types of contaminants. In addition, when a standard is set for a, a public drinking water supply, if a utility exceeds that standard, they are not allowed to serve that supply. So there's that added safety to it um, from uh, municipal utilities. It's also important to understand, really, your question has two components. One thing is things that are added to water, like fluoride, and I think Michael did a good job of addressing that. The other is contamination. Now, most of the things you're talking about are contaminants, and bottled water suffers from the same thing, except, as Michael said, they don't look. So if you close your eyes, you don't see anything. Agreed. But when we look at bottled water versus tap water, and we've done this on numerous occasions, the bottled water always comes out worse. Whether you're talking about bacterial contamination, whether you're talking about chemical contamination, whatever you're talking about, except fluoride. <laughs> Bottled water comes out worse. So fluoride is its own separate debate, and, and I would argue that it's a public health triumph, frankly, and Michael and I can have that debate, um, but either way. But that's another debate. The PPCPs, the pharmaceutical contamination and things like that you're talking about, what are they pumping in Maine? They're pumping groundwater. They're competing with the municipal water source. They're both getting their water from the same place. If there are pharmaceuticals in that water, they both have it. The difference is the municipality knows it has it and may even take steps to correct it. The bottled water company either doesn't look, or if they do look, they're certainly not going to tell you about it. They're not required to. Uh, one last point about fluoride. Uh, it's, in California, it's a state law that if you're a large uh, water company, you have to add fluoride to the water if it doesn't already contain an optimal amount from natural sources. So 
Los Angeles, for example, boosts the fluoride level just a little bit because our sources have fluoride already. Yes. Yeah, the question is whether when you extract water from a lake or somewhere like in Maine, whether isn't that water public property? Doesn't it belong to the state? Or can people just take it for free? Well, I think they did mention that uh, state law in Maine says whoever has the biggest pump can pump the most water. And that's different from other states. For example, in California, the, the law says there's a much more complicated law dictating who owns the water rights under land. For example, the land under us right here, the water in that land under us, the ground under us, belongs to the city of Los Angeles. And that's a historical grant by the King of Spain over 200 years ago. So it just depends on where you are, who owns the water, and if you have to pay to extract it or not. In some places you do, in some places you don't. It doesn't matter who owns the land. It's, it's the water is a separate, uh, can be a separate right from the land itself. Uh, water rights for groundwater and surface water are different, and they are not universal. I mean, they are not um, the same throughout every state. Um, they have changed over the years, uh, in, and as uh, Fred mentioned, in California, um, they are some of the most strict um, water rights, and typically what will happen is if somebody else comes and tries to tap somebody else's water supply, uh, it will end up in litigation. Um, there, there used to be a, a term first in time, first and right, or something like that. First in time, first and right. So if you're the first person to tap that source, then it is yours. Um, but then there, there were put in place some um, regulations regarding beneficial uses. So if you were found to be pulling water that reduced the beneficial use of the downstream users, um, you had to either stop taking that or replenish that supply. What you're seeing is really the difference between a state with low water levels and a lot of demand like California and a state with high water levels and not so much demand like Maine. That's why these companies target states like Maine is they know they can go there and, and tap into their water resources. If they start try to do the same thing in California, Fred and Mike would be standing there going, wait, what are you doing? Okay, anyone else? Well, I, I, I think it was mentioned in the film, the FDA, and you saw Senator Kerry grilling that guy, and that guy worked for the FDA, and he was making his own employee look bad in effect, which was kind of stupid in a way. But uh, it's the federal government that controls the FDA, how much money they have, what they can regulate. So if you wanted to change what the FDA does, you'd have to go through, your, through the legislature, the national legislature. But I would argue that uh, voting, and there was something in the movie about voting with your dollar, when you buy a bottle of water, you're supporting exactly what's behind that, everything behind it, the, the mining of the water, the, the extravagant cost, the, the plastics and everything else. So the best way to, to um, take action against this is what they, mentioned, what they mentioned in the film, is get your own bottle and use tap water. There's nothing wrong with tap water, um, com especially compared to bottled water. But it really, to get back to your question, the FDA is a federal agency, so it's the federal government that has to make changes to it. So you can elect different leadership, leadership that actually supports federal regulations. Those people are out there. They're not always supported by the American public. That's the reality of it. But the second thing that Fred brought up is really, to me, the most important thing. Far more important than voting in a voting booth, in my mind, is the voting you do every day with your money, with your wallet. So people buy bottled water, they will keep making bottled water. If you'll pay more for bottled water, they'll charge you more. That's the reality of it. If you stop buying it, the market dries up. Bottled water is the biggest moneymaker on this campus. You might be interested to know. So um, there's, when people at different institutions have tried to um, ban sales of bottled water from 
certain communities, they've met with a lot of resistance because there's a lot of money to be made in that. And so people argue that you should have the freedom to choose, which you should have the freedom to choose, but you should also be educated about the facts. And so then it's up to you to sort of vote with your wallet. Just to add um, a personal note to help you um, stop buying bottled water and possibly using something like this. This was um, $16, it's stainless steel. I can throw it in the dishwasher if I want to. Um, I usually rinse it out with hot water and that, that's plenty for it. Um, if you go to Amazon, and I'm not plugging a particular product, but you can buy two of these and you don't pay shipping or tax, so you can save that way. Um, most people that don't like tap water don't like it because of the taste, the smell, the odor. That's aesthetic, that's not health but that usually is what drives. The majority of the complaints that I got when I was in water quality, when I used to work for a, a different water utility, was regarding the taste of the water. There's two simple things you can do to make your water taste better. One is keep it cold. Cold water always tastes better than warm water. This lasts 12 hours um, that keeps cold. I throw about four ice cubes in here and the entire day it stays cold. I actually drink five of these a day, so I refill it several times. The other thing you can do, and I'm not plugging a particular um, product, but a GAC, granular activated carbon filter, uh, either Brita or Pure or the one that hooks up onto your refrigerator, will take out most of the unpleasant tastes and odors that you experience in tap water. Um, but again, if you just let your tap water run a little bit longer until it stays cold and stays constantly cool, um, that should improve the taste as well, because most of the tastes are coming from either chlorine that's added to help protect for biological reasons, um, biological safety, or because of the um, components of whatever your pipe is made of inside your home. Move to Santa Clarita. <laughs> the, the groundwater basin in the Santa Clarita Valley is loaded with minerals. And most people that move from LA to Santa Clarita don't like the taste. Um, and you do notice that difference. The, there isn't. I, I don't know of any um, magic mineral powder you can add to your drinking water. But what you could do is maybe just squeeze a little bit of lime, a little bit of lemon, um, cut up some cucumbers and throw that in there. Anything that'll make the, the water taste a little bit better, um, you know, is, is pretty simple to do. Yeah. Go ahead. You know, that's a great point, and, and I'm probably not the person to answer that. The best I can do is, you know, I get about a thousand students a year, and I educate them, and that's the most I can do. Now, I have a feeling that there are people here who could maybe better address your question in terms of what they're doing to get the word out, like an event like this. Yes, I think that um, just outreach, education, um, websites, there's the trouble is that people are kind of inundated with information these days and everybody's competing to get information out. There certainly are, you know, a, a lot of environmental campaigns and things in particular fighting over the bottled water industry. And I would just say spread the word and, uh, you know, we all do our best. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. It's, it's like you can probably reach more people by Facebook in a week than I reach in a year, you know? It's just the truth yeah. of the matter. It, information gets out there. Unfortunately, the lies are just as loud as the truth, and so it's incumbent on all of us to parse it apart and figure it out. If we hear conflicting reports about something, usually we can, if we take the effort, we can usually figure out which one's right pretty quickly. But it takes some effort, obviously. And coming to events like this is, is great. I've really enjoyed this discussion, by the way. You guys are great. Okay, I think we have to uh, close it there. And I want to thank everybody for coming and thank the speakers.
There are uh, refreshments at the back of the room. We do have sandwiches.